I think that's it. Thanks very much. And thanks, Marshall, for introducing the technology. So about six months ago, um, our lab got a Geomix TAP grant to do a pilot study um, using two samples. And we chose to look at brain cancer heterogeneity. And this is because brain cancer is a highly lethal disease, as many of you will know, with glioblastoma having a five-year survival rate of only 6.5%, and it's also the most frequently diagnosed type of brain cancer in Australia. And what's common amongst all of these highly diagnosed brain cancer subtypes is they're extremely heterogeneous, and that's what we wanted to use the Geomix platform to interrogate. So a little bit about glioma. They're derived from the glial cell types, astrocytes or oligodendrocytes, to generate astrocytomas or oligodendrogliomas. And so we have uh, low-grade gliomas, which are most frequently mutant for IDH1, R132H, oncometabolite um, uh, driver. And then um, a portion of these will develop into high-grade gliomas or will develop de novo, and these high-grade gliomas are generally IDH1 wild type, and um, they're also known as glioblastomas. And so we were interested to compare the heterogeneity and the TME of the high-grade IDH1 mutant anaplastic astrocytomas and the IDH1 wild type glioblastomas. And so we were able to identify some appropriate patient samples from the RMH. And each of these two samples um, both have very high expression of the tumour marker GFAP, which we were able to use um, on our geo Geomix platform. And the anaplastic astrocytoma has very strong expression of IDH1 R132H, as expected from the genomic information. And both of these tumours had a quite high um, fraction of cycling based on the KI67 positive staining. So the workflow was um, that we're able to take our freshly cut FFPE sections from these two patient samples, and uh, we stain them with, with three different protein markers, which I'll discuss shortly, and identify regions of interest. And we use the segmentation tool to identify the different cell types that we wanted to analyze. And from this, we use the whole transcriptome atlas to identify um, tumor cell heterogeneity, immune infiltration, and the properties of cycling KI67 positive tumor cells. So in order to segment these different types of populations, uh, we stain the tissue with GFAP, which is our tumor marker, CD45 to identify our immune cells, and KI67 to identify our cycling cells. And with the combination of these three key protein markers, we were able to segment all of our different cell types of interest. So on the left is the immunofluorescent staining, and on the right is the masking of um, all of the different cell types. So the combination of these protein markers allowed us to investigate our tumour cells that were not cycling, our tumour cells that were cycling, and our immune cells, and then we could deeply differentiate through the cycling and non-cycling immune cells as well. So this allowed us to get a really deep appreciation of what was going on in the tumour microenvironment of these two um, high-grade tumours. So I'll just um, take you through some of the different um, regions of interest that we selected for these two tumours. So on the left is a H&E of the glioblastoma IDH1 wild-type patient sample. And um, the, these regions of interest, one to three, um, were of interest to us because they had a lot of immune infiltration, as you can see from the CD45 um, segmented staining. But they also um, were identified by the pathologist as, as having some um, properties of heterogeneity. And we were also able to select regions of this tumour that were adjacent to normal brain so that we could select through to the tumour to a region of a mixture of tumour cells and normal cells and then identify the property of the normal cells that were adjacent at that border. In the IDH1 mutant anaplastic astrocytoma, um, we similarly had some regions that, of the tumour um, that appeared um, homogenous, that we wanted to investigate the cycling and non-cycling tumour cells and the immune cells in this region. 
And we also identified a region, which I'll talk about in a bit more detail, um, right at a border of a highly cycling and a non-cycling region of tumour. So the data that we got back was analysed by Saskia Freytag, um, who's a bioinformatician and co-lead of the lab. And we identified that uh, we had quite variable nuclei counts between the re different regions of interest, which is understandable because we had different numbers of cells, but we did have um, quite a high number of aligned reads for all of these regions. Um, looking at normalisation of the data, um, Saskia used the negative binomial di distribution of the raw data and she found that this had the best way to, to normalise this data. So the samples could be um, analysed in a PCA plot and we were able to identify all of the samples and the regions of interest associated with the glioblastoma were quite different to those associated with the anaplastic astrocytoma. And this also included the different immune cells that were pulled out from these regions as well. And so we were able to deconvolute the different immune cell types from this data, and we found that um, the IDH1 wild type glioblastoma had increased macrophage infiltration, whereas the mutant anaplastic astrocytoma had increased lymphoid cell infiltration. And these findings had also recently been published uh, in cell based on flow cytometry data so that we knew that we were seeing um, different expected populations in these two types of tumours. As I mentioned previously, in um, the IDH1 mutant tumour, there was a region of interest where the pathologist said that the tumour looked very homogenous, but when we looked at the KI67 staining, we could actually identify an upper region of really highly cycling tumour cells um, directly adjacent to a region that had very few cycling tumour cells. So we were really interested to segment these regions and to identify what the properties were of the highly cycling and the lowly cycling region, given that they were intimately adjacent with each other. And uh, these are the cells that we pulled out from the tumour cells and the immune cells. So in this border region, deconvolution of the immune cells identified that there were increased cytotoxic CD8 T cells and also B cell immune infiltrate in the tumour region that had reduced tumour cell cycling. And in the region that had increased cell cycling, there were more endothelial cells, as you could expect. And then investigating um, the transcriptome of the highly cycling and the lowly cycling tumour cells we found that in the highly cycling tumour region, there was high expression of histone coding genes, as you can imagine, but also genes involved in neurogenesis and regeneration. And when we looked across all of the tumour cell samples of the KS67 positive and negative regions, we could see consistently that we were really getting markers of highly cycling cells, and um, it really validated the data that we were getting. We could also use the... Uh, the tumour cell data to identify the differences in the transcriptomes between the IDH1 mutant and wild-type tumours. And, um, and this revealed classic characteristics of IDH1 mutant tumours, as well as deconvolution of the different cell types in the tumour regions, where we found that the glioblastoma patient had a predominantly mesenchymal subtype, whereas the IDH1 mutant um, patient had more oligodendrocyte-rich tumours. So in conclusion from this pilot study, uh, we were able to confirm um, the, the differences in lymph lymphoid cell infiltrate and cycling and non-cycling tumour cells. And now we can start to investigate more properties of the heterogeneity of the tumour cells between these two types of tumours, but also in the different regions. Um, and importantly, we're using FFPE material, which means that we can go back into the archives and identify some, some good uh, tumours to use in the future. And so uh, we're able to expand on this study now and really investigate some of those interesting findings that we found in the pilot study. So I'd just like to end um, with acknowledging Jim Woodall and Saskia Freytags, the co-leads of the Brain Cancer Lab and really highlight the bioinformatic work of Saskia Freytag and Joel Moffat, who are really creating a nice pipeline to investigate the genomics data. Thanks very much.
Thanks very much, Sarah. So uh, we'll open the floor for questions for both Marshall and Sarah, if anyone has any. If there are, while we're waiting on people wandering down, any from online? Yes, we have a couple of questions that came in, and I think the first ones are for Marshall. Um, the first one is, um, are all antibodies added at the same time? How do you control for effects such as steric hindrance? Antibodies on, this is probably a geomix assay, um, I'm assuming. Uh, yes, I assume so. It doesn't say here, but I, I think so, yes. Yeah, the antibodies are added at the same time. So there's a, a differentiation between the workflow. So there's a actual visualization markers which are done, um, and that's just for three markers. So we use three antibodies to label specific cell populations of interest, and then we have a whole cocktail of antibodies that are tested um, with those markers to make sure that there's no issues. Okay, and then uh, if there's no question from the floor, there's another one for you, Marshall. Um, how do you achieve 50 nanometer XY resolution? What segmentation method do you use and how do you validate it? Right, so we have uh, each, the, the microscope that's actually, um, there's IP around that, so it's, it's a customized microscope um, that's built, an imaging system that's on that. Um, and what, sorry, what was the second question that was there? Um, how do you validate it that you really have the, I don't know, it's like how do you achieve the resolution and segmentation. what segmentation method yeah. do you use? Yep, so the segmentation algorithm is based off of uh, localizing the transcripts in uh, nine different Z stacks. Uh, so each uh, mRNA transcript is given an X, Y, and Z location, and then we use a series of morphology markers to help define those regions. So we have a nucleic acid stain, uh, two markers for the cellular membrane, uh, CD3 and pancytokeratin, which seems to stain most tissues really well, and then we use a version of cell pros, which is an open source segmentation tool. Um, and, and an AI-assisted algorithm. I, do, I will say that um, our data sets are also uh, openly available for people using Halo or for clever ECRs that are developing you know, segmentation algorithms um, that you can incorporate those data sets into uh, different pipelines. Okay, thank you. And then I have one more question, which I believe is for Sarah. And that's the question, what tool was used for the RNA deconvolution? <laughs> I'm a question for Saskia, but uh, or, yeah. sorry, I can't answer that. <laughs> okay, we'll take these and I'll take all the questions that were asked. Uh, just to let everybody know they uh, will be answered uh, uh, probably uh, by the speakers after the symposium, and we will make these answers available to all attendees. But we have a couple of questions on the floor, and I make way for them. Thank you. Um, I had have, I'd have a question for Sarah as well. I'd be mostly interested in the tumor border as opposed to the tumor core. Did you, in addition to the number of cell types that you identified, look at the transcriptomic differences between the cells located at the tumor border versus inside the tumor? Or if not, is that planned? Yes, that's absolutely planned. So at the moment, um, at the study that I showed you was the pilot for N equals 1, which um, Saskia tells me she will not perform very much informatics analysis on. But we are getting two more glioblastoma patients and two more anaplastic astrocytoma as well, which our pathologist has now identified that we know we're seeing similar regions in um, the histopathology of the sample so that we can now perform some more statistical analysis on the different regions. So this is this is for Sarah also, and I guess that um, other other speakers that have shown us some data today might reflect on this. How much are we depending on pathologists as the initial step to decide what we what we should and not look at? And now you've just shown us some images that the pathology wouldn't have picked up. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just your thoughts on that. Thanks. Yeah, that's a really interesting point. Um, and we selected the samples because our pathologist said that they looked really homogenous. And so we're really interested to see transcriptionally how different the tumor cells really are in the different regions, but also in the immune infiltrate as well. Some of the key characteristics we could identify based on immunostaining. So when we looked at KI67, we could clearly see that there would be regions that would be particularly interesting. Um, but yeah, now we're working really closely with the pathologist Sam Roberts Thompson at RMH to to have a deeper look at some of these samples in the future. Uh, 
I think Arutha, you have to come down. <laughs> Great talk, Marshall, sir. Um, I just wanted to follow up. What would you, so you showed the geomic sort of data. What would you typically follow that up with? And I guess it's a question, you know, that we're thinking about actively as well. Technologies um, where, you know, and Marshall might be able to feed into that. The market's ultra saturated at the moment. How do we pick, you know, it's shades of gray, right? A couple of years ago, black and white. How do we now, you know, with all these amazing technologies, decide on a workflow? And I, I think it's, it's to um, Sarah's point, does that geomics lead to a cosmics experiment or is it more geomics? Is it an orthogonal technology? Um, and just your thoughts around that. I'll just quickly say my point of view and then I'll pass over to Marshall. Um, we're definitely thinking about doing some maybe scope studies based on the geomics data. Yeah, so I can speak to nanostring solutions. <laughs> um, so I think, yeah, the, you know, looking at, uh, you know, a particular area of the tissue and if you're identifying specific biomarkers, um, and you know that area of tissue um, and, and those specific target genes, and that's a natural progression over to a cosmics experiment. Say you've you know done single cell RNA seq. There's specific cell subsets. You know I, I want to know what this T cell is doing, how it's interacting with the tumor and its environment. That more lends itself to a cosmics experiment. Um, so I think it is a natural progression. And then once those markers are validated and you know what's going on, if you're looking at larger cohort studies, then you would move back to the geomics instrument just simply because of the throughput um, and the efficiency of the workflow. So as I mentioned as well, we also, um, the Lycabond RX sits upstream. Um, it's a fully automated um, workflow, a lot less hands-on time. Yeah, it's not a finicky type of thing. Okay, thank you very much.